Today, we live in a world where information is more accessible than ever, yet the world is still searching for answers. Despite advances in technology and living standards, the basic question of how to achieve happiness not only remains unanswered, but many have even stopped trying. The me generation is now coming to terms with its results, a society in which the only real purpose for living is sense gratification, and even at this, we seem to be failing. This may be survival, but are we living? Few nations can claim a history as rich as that of India's. Few still have contributed as much to civilization. However, India's recent history paints a mixed picture. The wounds of partition still run deep, with the repercussions still being felt nationwide. Poverty continues to ravage the nation despite sustained economic growth. Due to its impact within the technology sector, India has risen to become the 13th largest nation in terms of gross national product. Corruption and political dissolution stifle leadership, despite suggestions that the third largest military power will soon emerge as a major player within world affairs. Despite its current predicaments, many world authorities still continue to point towards India as a guide for mankind, holding the solutions to many of today's dilemmas. As Toynbee once said, it is becoming quite clear that a chapter with a Western beginning will have an Indian ending if it is not to end in self-destruction of the human race. At this supremely dangerous moment in history, the only way of salvation for mankind is the Indian way. Before the East India Dock Company took advantage of infighting and began the Raj, prior to Muhammad Ghori defeating Prithvi Raj Chauhan to capture Delhi and establish Mughal rule in India, and even before Alexander the Great captured the Indus River region, India was home to a society of great advancement. It is this history of India that led American expert William Durant to state, India was the motherland of our race, and Sanskrit the mother of European languages. India was the mother of our philosophy, of much of mathematics, of the ideals embodied in Christianity, of self-governance and democracy. In many ways, Mother India is a mother to us all. Ancient India's contributions to world civilization are indeed profound. India is credited with inventing the number system, the concept of zero, the first university, Takshasila, medical surgery, and the first accurate calculations of the time taken by the Earth to orbit the Sun. These and many other contributions prompted Max Muller, the German Indologist, to state, If I am asked which nation had been advanced in the ancient world in respect of education and culture, then I would say it was India. Lesser known contributions include the distillation of perfumes, the making of dyes, the extraction of sugar, the game of chess, the weaving of cotton, the principles of magnetism and alchemy, and the concepts of the atom and relativity. Historian Grant Duff suggests that many of the advances in the sciences that we consider today to have been made in Europe were in fact made in India centuries ago. Although we may acknowledge the contributions of India to modern day society, there is little here that could provide any solutions to the world's major problems. Politicians and scientists propound an illusion of better standards of living, but are these better living standards or conditions for survival? Multinational corporations feed off our desire to escape, offering drugs, alcohol and entertainment as refuge from modern day living. Those that fail to take refuge fail to cope and fall prey to the disease of the day, depression. Consumer society is buying ignorance by the lorry load and India's contribution seems to provide no answers. So why then do many feel India has something of real value to offer humanity? The view that our lives may have a far greater reach than we can imagine is considered outmoded as our spiritual values and a grand vision for mankind and its place in the universe. In the outlook of modern science, morality and responsibility have no actual meaning. Why should one observe these values if life ends at the grave? Matters of religion and spirit are relegated to illusion by Freud, the father of psychology. Fictitiousness by Comte, the father of sociology. And ideology by Marx, the father of communism. In the extraordinary journey from matter to body, from body to mind, from mind to intelligence, and from intelligence to spirit. Materialism halted the journey at the very first stage and proclaimed all subsequent developments to be nothing but arrangements of matter. Why this matter would get up and eventually start writing poetry was not explained. 
The basic needs of a person can be divided into spiritual and material need. Accepting materialistic needs alone as a be-all and end-all has led to living being replaced by survival. In a visit to India in 1986, Pope John Paul II announced to the people of India that he had not come there to teach anything but to learn from their rich spiritual heritage and declared that India's mission is crucial because of her intuition of the spiritual nature of man. Indeed, India's greatest contribution to the world can be to offer it a spiritual vision of man. In fact, it seems that India itself has been at fault in losing its perspective. Even political problems seem to be resulting from a loss of real spiritual ideals. Mahatma Gandhi, less than a century ago, affirmed that, For me, there is no politics devoid of religion. They serve religion. Politics bereft of religion is a death trap because they kill the soul. As Mark Twain affirms, in religion, India is the only millionaire, the one land that all men desire to see, and having seen once, by even a glimpse, would not give that glimpse up for all the shows of all the rest of the world. India is the birthplace of values and concepts such as renunciation, meditation, yoga and ahimsa. A place where the ideal of simple living and high thinking is tangibly visible. India offers to the world a genuine meaning to life and the perfect combination of materialistic and spiritual ideals. The ancient Greek philosopher and traveller Apollonius Tyanius in the first century echoed this view. In India, I found a race of mortals living upon the earth but not adhering to it, inhabiting cities but not fixed to them, possessing everything but possessed by nothing. Spirituality is India's greatest contribution. Spirituality does not mean a withdrawal from the world, but an action in the world that is transformative and thus provides a qualitative change within the world situation. Thoughts of poverty evoke faces of emaciated people, condemned to be poor, but a great tragedy is the spiritual poverty that has engulfed the world. The heritage of India is truly rich, and despite many of the seemingly insurmountable challenges it faces today, the answers to many of the questions faced by humanity can be found close to home, within India's most precious of jewels, the Bhagavad Gita. The Indian way of life provides the vision of the natural, real way of life. We veil ourselves with unnatural masks. On the face of India are the tender expressions which carry the mark of the Creator's hand. George Bernard Shaw